Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized tonight's event. Um, I'd like to welcome our live audience here in San Francisco at the club's uh, new facility at 110 Embarcadero, and also our radio and online audiences. We have tonight uh, Yasha Munk, the uh, author of The People Versus Democracy. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He's a lecturer on government at Harvard University and a senior fellow at New America. He's a columnist at Slate and a host of the Good Fight podcast. He's a leading expert on the rise of populism and the crisis of liberal democracy. Yasha is now working on the crisis of liberal democracy, his papers on the rise of populism and the growing openness of citizens of democratic countries to authoritarian alternatives has been published by the Journal of Democracy and Foreign Affairs, among others. In his second academic book, which is under contract with Harvard University Press and will also be translated into German and Korean, he argues that liberalism and democracy are coming apart, creating forms of both illiberal democracy and undemocratic liberalism. Yasha was born and raised in Germany and has lived in England, France, and Italy. Before coming to Harvard, he started, studied at Trinity College, Cambridge, and the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales, and Columbia University. He speaks fluent English, German, French, Italian, strong Polish. Does that mean swear words? Or? <laughs> <laughs> and has some basic Spanish and Latin. So uh, that's Yasha, and, and uh, I think uh, the club will recognize our moderator tonight, Francis Fukuyama, who has been here many times before. He's uh, currently a senior fellow at Stanford's Freeman Spegley Institute for International Studies, and his new book on identity, obviously identity politics, will be coming out in September. So thank you very much, Francis. Thank you very much. Uh, George, thank you very much. It's a delight to be in this beautiful new facility with this wonderful view uh, out the front window. Uh, so um, I'm, I jumped at the opportunity to have a conversation with Yasha Monk. Uh, he's one of the more exciting uh, younger public intellectuals that's, I think, made a lot of waves in all of the uh, things that he's written. He first came to my attention uh, for an article that he published in the Journal of Democracy a couple of years ago. Uh, based on data that was showing that the support for democracy among young people in the United States was actually on the decline uh, with a corresponding uh, uh, trend towards uh, uh, favoring authoritarian uh, government. Uh, but he's, you know, since then uh, done a lot of very acute observations about the nature of democracy, we're, we actually have something in common because we both started out as political theorists. So we started <laughs> with, you know, Plato and Aristotle and Rousseau and Machiavelli. Uh, but I think that that, um, that perspective gives uh, his analysis of the current democratic situation uh, a great deal more depth than a lot of the uh, commentators. So uh, we will begin uh, by, I guess, the question that comes obviously to mind when you just look at the title of your book the people versus democracy. So democracy is supposed to be about the people. So how can you have a conflict between the people and democracy? And what do you mean by democracy? For that matter, what do you mean by the people? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, some of the best book titles don't make sense when you look too closely. So perhaps this is the case of mine. But um, no, there is something, I think, that explains that paradox. Um, part of it is the research that you reference. But actually what you're seeing is really people um, starting to fall out of love with a democratic system. In the United States, over two-thirds of older Americans, born in the 1930s and 1940s, say that it's essential to them to live in a democracy. Among younger Americans, born since 1980, less than one-third do. Um, 20 years ago, one in 16 Americans said that they thought army rule was a good system of government. Uh, according to the more recent polls, it is one in six. Um, and you see similar data in other countries as well. Um, so in data from last summer, we saw that the number of Germans, of French people, of uh, Brits, who think that a strong ruler who doesn't have to bother with parliament and elections is a good thing, has roughly doubled over the course of the last 20 years. It's now 50% in France and the United Kingdom. So there is one sense of people versus democracy, which is that people actually are getting more and more critical of democracy. But after years of disappointments with this government and that government, we know that they all hate Congress and think that, you know, lice and used car salesmen are better than Congress and all those kinds of things. That's actually started to translate into a distrust of the institutions themselves. I think there's also a deeper sense here, which is that we've always assumed that the two basic elements of our political system, 
liberal democracy go together quite naturally. When I say liberal here, but it has nothing to do with uh, Barack Obama versus George W. Bush, um, it means a commitment to individual rights, to the rule of law, to the separation of powers, um, the things that allow us as individuals to lead our lives in a self-determined manner. And obviously the other element, dem democracy, then means some form of self-rule that we actually collectively decide on our own fate, that our political system manages to translate popular views into public policies to some extent. Well, I think that these two things are starting to slide apart in, in important ways. That for a long time, we've started to have a system of rights without that much democracy, by which I mean that our system hasn't been very good at translating popular views into public policies because of the immense role that money plays in politics, because of the revolving door between lobbyists and legislators, because the political elite has become, in many ways, a class upon itself, and because more and more important decisions have been taken out of public contestation because of a rise of independent bureaucratic agencies, supreme courts, central banks, trade treaties, international organizations, and so on and so forth. That is one part of the equation. The other part is the part that I would call democracy without rights or illiberal democracy. So what is illiberal democracy? It is populists who say, I can fix all of your problems. All you need to do is to trust me to take care of everything. I alone can fix it. Um, but that requires you, first of all, to treat roughly the people who are not really like you and me, who are not really part of the people, the immigrants, the religious minorities, the sexual minorities, and so on and so forth. And secondly, it requires you to say, to recognize that I alone truly represent the people. So if the courts try to stop me from doing what I want, if Congress tries to stop me from doing what I want, if the media criticize me, then that's illegitimate. They are traitors. They are enemies of the people. They are un-American. And what you get then is a system that is democratically legitimated at first because the majority of the people votes for it. But because by and by the strongman takes more and more power, it becomes very difficult to dislodge them democratically. So the second meaning of the people versus democracy is that the people vote for a bunch of rulers, like, say, Recep Erdogan in Hungary, or, uh, in Turkey, or Viktor Orban in, 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 um, uh, in Hungary, um, who take on so much power that though they were elected democratically, it becomes impossible to get them out of power by democratic means. The Hungarians have actually gotten very good at gerrymandering, among other things, so they're taking a page out of the American playbook in that respect. But maybe you could talk about the fate of either democratic liberal or you know li illiberal democracy around the world, because there's, this isn't just an American phenomenon. I mean, I did notice that a lot of your illusions seem to be fairly close to home, uh, but this is a global phenomenon, right? I didn't allude to anything. I, I don't know what <laughs> you're talking about. Um, no, that's right, and I think it's really important. You know, it, it is, uh, you know, Donald Trump, to to call him by his name is taking up so much of all of our collective mind space that it gets very difficult to put him in perspective of the other things that are going on in the world. And my fear is that um, we might manage to beat Donald Trump, but it's going to be much harder to beat the wider populist movement discontent which he represents, because this thing has been rising for 20, 30 years. When you look at the average vote share of populist parties in Europe, it was 8% in the year 2000, and it is about 25% now. And this has started to rise two and a half decades ago, and it's kept on rising. It is not just in the United States, it is in all of these other countries as well. So absolutely, we need to look beyond Donald Trump. And what you see there is the slow coming of age uh, of a real ideological competitor to liberal democracy, um, which is sometimes called illiberal democracy, sometimes called hierarchical democracy. Um, and it's proving to be surprisingly popular, in part because illiberal democratic rulers dominate state TV in countries where that's quite important, force the sale of um, private TV stations into the hands of their allies and so on. So it's not on an even playing field that they do so well. But when you look at the polls that we do have in Poland and Hungary, the incumbent governments are incredibly effective. And that's because they've developed a playbook 
That playbook resembles that of Donald Trump in certain ways, which is to say outrageous things that prove that you're not part of a political elite, to really try and stoke social tensions as much as possible. But it's also much more strategic than our president has acted in, in three key ways. One of them is that they, uh, in all of the rhetoric, try to portray their country as embattled from within by enemies of the people and from outside by dangerous rivals and adversaries who are out to uh, undermine, for example, the Hungarian nation by sending refugees in who are going to take away the Christian character of Hungary by having the European Union try to undermine Hungarian sovereignty and by having evil Jewish billionaires like George Soros secretly plotting to undermine the Hungarian nation. All of these are claims that Viktor Orban, the, the Prime Minister of Hungary, has actually made. Um, and so once they have set up this set of real threat, they, in a second step, um, make some big concessions to their supporters, give them stuff that actually improves the material livelihood in a concrete way. We see that with a Polish populist government that sends 500 zloty, that's a lot of money in Poland, to families with two children every month. So you get a big, nice line in your bank account, 500 zloty from the populist government. Um, and then the third step is that they attack the independence of their political institutions in a really systematic way. That they say, the judiciary has been inefficient and unfair for many decades, so we have to reform it. And of course, the point is to staff it with your own supporters. The electoral system hasn't been working very well, so I'm going to gerrymander the system in my favor. The Electoral Commission needs to be reformed. We need to retire all of the people who are on it at the moment. And lo and behold, all of my political allies are on it. Uh, and as in the Hungarian case, they end up fining all of the opposition parties uh, so much money that they can't campaign anymore, while miraculously declining to investigate the ruling party, uh, Fidesz. Now, what's striking to me about Donald Trump is two things. First of all, that even though he has actually been quite bad at following this playbook, he has already done some real institutional damage. He already has consolidated control of the Republican Party and formerly independent institutions like the House Judiciary Committee and the House Intelligence Committee are clearly now stooges of the president in a way that's quite serious. And we're seeing his ongoing attacks on the independence of the Department of Justice and the FBI, which are very worrying. But secondly, that Trump really has been quite bad at following this playbook that when he talks rhetorically about the threat, it is always a threat to him, not the threat to America. <laughs> that when he attacks the independence of institutions, it's not out of a sense of strategic weakening of them, it is tactically whatever he needs to do right now to keep himself out of trouble. And that he has been spectacularly bad at actually delivering presents to his key supporters in the population rather than to rich individuals and corporations. Um, now, that's reassuring, because I think it makes it less likely that Trump will be able to broaden his base in the way that Orban and Kaczynski have done. But it's also concerning, because it means that our institutions might prove a lot more brittle than they have been for the last year and a half if an actually talented populist became president of his country. So you uh, said that this has actually been building over the last 20 years, but it seems like in the last couple of years, uh, with the Brexit vote and obviously the Trump vote and then recent votes in Germany and Italy uh, most recently, things are really speeding up. Why now? Like, why is this happening in the year 2017-18? Uh, uh, well, so it's not clear to me that there is a step change, right? I mean, when you look at the curve, it is, I mean, you know, it's never a straight curve, but it's surprisingly straight. I mean, it looks like a, like, like a curve, right? I mean, often social scientists say, here's a curve, and you, you need some fancy statistical program to see it, right? This is one of those things which, which you can see with the naked eye and it's pretty clear. Um, so I would say two things. A, um, we've noticed it now because populists have come within striking distance of winning. Mm -hmm. In most places, they're not yet favored to win. The average virtue is about 25%. So a lot of things have to go wrong for them to actually win outright majorities. A lot did go wrong with the 2016 election campaign mm -hmm. in the United States. But unlike five years ago, they're at a level of strength where when everything does go wrong, they do win. So that's but, very but concerning. What are, the, what are the, the, yeah, the, the bigger forces, though, that are you know, gelling right now that, that 
drive this this whole phenomenon. Right. So there, I would say there's nothing about those aren't about right this moment. Mm -hmm. Those are things that have been at play for a long yeah. time, mm -hmm. and I think there's essentially three of them. I mean, one way of thinking about this is right. Why is it that democracy has been seemingly very stable for 50 or 60 years and is now coming to be pretty unstable? Well, you have to look for these analogies. My best metaphor for this is from the work, uh, speaking of political theory and philosophy, of, of, of a British philosopher, Bertrand Russell, who tells the story of a chicken on a farm. So bear with me. Um, <laughs> the, the chicken has the kind of life that we all want the chickens we eat for dinner to have, which is to say that you know, it runs around the farm and is very happy and gets to chat with the other animals and all those kinds of things. Um, any local San Francisco restaurant would be happy to serve it. Um, <laughs> And all of the other animals, for it is so happy, are warning it and saying, the farmer only seems nice. One day he's going to come and kill you. <laughs> and the chicken says, what on earth are you talking about? <laughs> you know, the, the, the farmer is really nice to me. He feeds me every day. Why should he suddenly act so differently? Well, as Russell says in his nice wit, uh, you know, one day the farmer does come to wring the chicken's neck, showing that more sophisticated views as to the uniformity of causation would have been to the chicken's benefit. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what does that mean? Well, that means that there's scope conditions that we have to think about in the world, right? As long as the chicken was too thin for the market, the farmer had an incentive to keep feeding it. Once it was fat enough to fetch a good price, he had an incentive to slaughter it. Okay, so what are the scope conditions of liberal democratic stability? What was different in 1980 and 1960 from now? What well, seems to be was three big things. The first is a stagnation of living standards for average people. So from 1935 to 1960, the living standard of the average American roughly doubled. From 1960 to 1985, it roughly doubled again. Since 1985, it's essentially been flat. It's essentially been stagnant. That really changes how people think about politics. Um, you know, they used to say, I don't love politicians. I don't completely trust them. You know, they're kind of weird. But hey, you know what? I'm twice as rich as my parents were. My kids are going to be twice as rich as me. Let's give them the benefit of a doubt. Now they're saying, you know what, I've worked really hard on my life. I don't have that much to show for it. My kids are probably going to do worse than me. Let's try something new. How bad could things get? <laughs> um, the second thing, I think, is around cultural identity. And this obviously intersects uh, with, with, with a book that you're writing at the moment that I'm very excited to read. Um, when you look at continental Europe, Democracy really took hold at a moment when these countries, both in fact and even more so in their self-conception, were incredibly homogeneous. In Germany, where I grew up, democracy took hold after World War II, which was not a coincidence. Um, after the horrible genocide of the Holocaust, Germany was actually very homogeneous, and the self-conception was even more so. What made a true German in 1960, 1970, it was somebody who descended ethnically from one group. It was certainly not somebody who was brown or black. It was certainly not a Muslim or Hindu, or for that matter, as I am a Jew. Um, now, through 50 years of immigration, that has started to change, um, and, and that is a good thing. Um, I think we've come a long way in adopting a more liberal understanding of citizenship, uh, but there's a lot of people who have something to lose from that. If you weren't the richest, and most educated, most successful person in the world, you got a lot of status from saying, you know what, at least I'm better and I belong unlike you know, these immigrants over there. Well, that immigrant might now be a politician or he might be your boss, and that's great. But it does mean real loss for some people, and so it shouldn't surprise us that there's real resistance against this reinvention of who gets to count as an Italian, as a Swede, as a German, and so on. In the United States, the situation is both similar and different. It is different in the obvious sense that America has always been a multi-ethnic society, but it is similar in that there's been a very strict racial hierarchy. The good news here is that we've come an awfully long way in overcoming that hierarchy. Despite all of the deep injustices that persist and that we must always be mindful of and struggle against, there's virtually no question that it's better to be just about any form of minority in this country today than 20 or 40 or 60 years ago. And a lot of people welcome and celebrate that. I imagine that nearly everybody in this room does. But again, it also means that a lot of people have had to give up real status and material privileges. And so it shouldn't surprise us that there is some real backlash against that. Now, if you take that economic frustration and you take the um, 
fears about cultural change and changing conception of a nation and the status loss. And you add to that the internet, which makes it much easier for extreme voices to enter our politics, to bypass media gatekeepers, and so on and so forth, you get a pretty dangerous cocktail. So um, I think that everybody in the audience uh, is convinced that we are in trouble uh, around the world in terms of our democratic institutions. And I think they're on the edge of their seats wanting to know. So great analysis. What the hell do we do about it? Uh, you just have to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think it has to be a response to the main problems that I've outlined. So one of the things is that we need to give people a sense again that the political system is responsive. It's, there's a bit of that that's easy and a bit of that that's hard. I think the bit of that that's hard is how to deal with technocratic institutions and international organizations and so on and so forth. Think of a, a wicked problem like climate change. In order to deal with climate change, you need to coordinate the actions of 200 countries around the world. That is incredibly hard to do, and it's very, very difficult to think about how we can ever do that in a way where you or I can change course next year mm. or have a real sense that we're in control of what's happening there. So I think that there is a genuine technocratic dilemma or an anti-democratic dilemma which posits our ability to feel that we control what's happening against the performance of institutions, which is important for its legitimacy as well. And I don't think there's an easy solution to that. The populists say there's an easy solution, which is abolish all of those things, give power back to the people. But if you follow the news, I think you've had a sense of what it looks like when you give power back to the people. In reality, it means giving power to your friends and relatives. Um, <laughs> but there is a part of this which can generally be solved, and that is getting money out of our politics to a far greater extent than we have. It involves campaign finance reform. <laughs> it involves... Um, actually strengthening the capacity of Congress. One of the more informal ways in which people have a ton of power is that uh, senators and congressmen can't actually pay the staffers well enough to retain them. And so why do they go to the lobbyists? Because the lobbyists are the trusted staffers from a couple of years ago, right? So we can change some of that. Um, we can have some electoral reform. I think California ha has made a good step with urban primaries, but there's a set of other uh, reforms so we can make at the state and, and local level to, to change some of our politics. That's one thing. The second thing is to make sure that people's living standards aren't stagnating in the way they are. Look, I'm in favor of capitalism. I'm in favor of free trade. I'm in favor of globalization. For some people on the right, it's easy to s dismiss those things. If you only care about the living standards of a steel worker in Michigan, I still think you're wrong, but, but I get where you're coming from. If you actually care about the poor in the world, if you actually care about economic distribution, look at the incredible advances we've made in the last 20, 25 years. Two billion people who were in actual poverty, without electricity, with very limited education, not sure they would have food that night, who are now middle class. So we can't reject some of those basic parts of our economic system, but we can fight much, much, much harder to make sure that we distribute the gains from that much more fairly. There is no reason why it should be so easy for rich individuals and for corporations to evade paying the fair share of taxes. It is much easier to punish people much more thoroughly, to investigate them much more if they try to hide the money in tax havens. There's lots of reforms that nation states, using their biggest asset, which is territory, can take to ensure that corporations actually pay taxes where they do business and not where they have a nominal headquarters. Going beyond that, there are ways in which we can boost productivity by investing in education and by investing in lifelong learning, not just for people who've just lost their job, but for people who want to keep uh, learning new skills. And we can make sure, this is something that uh, I'm sure you will have no idea what I'm talking about in this wonderful city of San Francisco, that even when people have decent incomes, they don't spend all of it on life's necessities from education to healthcare to housing. And that is a matter, in part, of building more housing, of overcoming some of the sclerotic regulation that does actually make it harder to offer more of the goods that people need. So I think there's a whole set of things that we can do 
in order for more moderate political parties to reimagine their economic policies, not by becoming ideologically more radical, but by actually having real imagination about what an economic policy that harnesses the power of globalization and free trade for ordinary people would look like. Meet the demand of a Brexiteers of taking back control. Make people feel that the state can help them be in control of their fate, and it itself can be in control of its fate in the age of globalization. The next thing is responding to the identity challenge. Um, and I'd love to talk more with you about, about what solutions you see there or how, how you might diagnose the problem differently. But, but I think on the main message, we're probably aligned, which is what I would call inclusive patriotism. Look, as somebody who grew up uh, as a Jew in Germany, I was very tempted for a long time to leave nationalism behind in the 20th century, which it so cruelly shaped. But I've come to rethink that. You have an incredibly powerful exclusive nationalism on the right, what I would call a white nationalism in the United States and in parts of the White House. And you can either leave the incredibly resonant territory of nationalism to that end of a political spectrum, or you can try and repurpose it. You can try and fight against it. And you're not going to do that by saying, let's give up on collective identity altogether, as I might have done a few years ago. And you're not going to do that by saying, let's celebrate every form of identity at the subnational level, religious, ethnic, uh, sexual, and so on, but not the national one. You're going to do that by defending everybody against discrimination and against the attacks of the county suffering unreservedly, and at the same time, <coughs> emphasizing what we have in common, what unites us, why it is that the nation has historically been a force for actually drawing out more solidarity across racial and ethnic lines, across your immediate family, across your village, so it can be a positive force. Nationalism, in my mind, is a half-domesticated animal. If we leave it on its own, the worst kinds of people, <coughs> Steve Bannon, are going to come in <laughs> and stoke it and bait it until it runs wild. And instead, we need to reclaim it for an inclusive nationalism. And the last thing, very quickly, is that I don't think the solution to the internet and to social media is to regulate it from the state. There are certain forms of regulation we need, but I don't think that the forms of censorship that are now taking over in Europe are the right response. I think it is to, to, to push them to enforce the community guidelines better, but also to actually fight for our political values. Francis mentioned Plato and Aristotle. Well, from Plato to Aristotle and from Rousseau to the Founding Fathers, every theorist of some form of self-government or some form of republic knew that you need to transmit your values from one generation to the next. And we haven't been terribly good at actually doing that. We've decimated civics educations in high school. At Harvard, where I teach, we're great at telling students about the flaws of our political system, which are real and which we have to always acknowledge, but we're very bad at telling them why it's better to live in a liberal democracy, why it's better to live in the United States, even today, than it is to live in Russia or China or Venezuela or Iran or Cuba. And so I think that we actually need to get a new sense of mission about making, you know, a real push to get people to see not just the bad in our system, but also the good. Okay, we're going to, we've got quite a number of questions already, uh, so I want to get to those. But I do want to ask you one question that has been bothering me a lot. <laughs> Since the financial crisis in 2008, uh, you would have thought that there'd be a lot of populism, rightly so, because this is a crisis created on Wall Street, these big banks and you know, billionaires, the mm -hmm. oligarchs uh, that, that run uh, that, the financial sector, uh, took uh, bad risks, they, they lost, and then ordinary people suffered, but they came through it just fine. And you would think that this would actually create a groundswell of left-wing, traditional left-wing populism for more redistribution and, you know, a lot of the things that you talk about, getting rid of the tax havens and, you know, changing the tax code to make them pay their fair share. Uh, and yet, what we have is right-wing populism. Um, 
And the left, you know, has been in decline everywhere, at least the traditional left. And so the German Social Democrats went from like 40% 20 years ago to now, you know, close to 20. Uh, the French socialists have disappeared and we'll have to see what happens in November, but, you know, the Democrats have been losing, uh, uh, losing elections. So how do you, why is it all coming out on the right rather than on the left, given what's happened to our economy? Well, so... Um you know, there's some parts of the world, obviously, where left populism is mm -hmm. prevalent, not just Venezuela, but, but southern, southern Europe, um, where the economic problems have been deeper and of longer standing. Um, but, but I think in the end, the answer is relatively simple, that um, a flesh and blood enemy is always easier than an abstract institutional enemy. And, um, you know, if you have left-wing populists uh, invading against the banks and so on, and you have right-wing uh, populists invading against, you know, scary Muslims and immigrants and so on. Um, unfortunately, the ones who race bait and the ones who victimize minorities are going to win. Um, so, you know, my fear about left-wing populism is not just that it too can be destructive, as we see in countries like Venezuela. It's that often it is left-wing populists who fail to come to the rescue of liberal democratic institutions in the hope of winning, but end up enabling the right-wing populists who in the end, I think, just have a more powerful emotional register to play on. But if you allow me, instead of, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I really look forward to, to, to hearing the audience questions, but I also want to ask a question of you. Okay. Um, so, you know, you're thinking about identity at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, You know, I thought a lot about the fact that actually an equal multi-ethnic society is really a historically unique experiment. Right? There, you know, perhaps Canada's a little better than us, but that doesn't, you know, that has its own problems. There is no real example of it. So what do you do we need to do to, to build that society? And what, what would it actually look like? I mean, what are some of the principles that that we would live by in, in that kind of society? Um, Small question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it actually echoes some of the some of the questions that uh, have come from the audience. So uh, I think that, as you were saying, uh, a kind of patriotic nationalism of a certain sort of, a, of the right kind of liberal, you know, open, tolerant sort is very important because a democracy actually needs to have common memory, common values, people have to share things. And the question is, you know, how do you get back to that? And I think the American narrative over the past uh, 250 years has been a very tortured one because that identity, uh, you know, for the first 100 years or so was Protestant, white, male, you know, uh, extremely restrictive. And in a sense, we fought a civil war, uh, you know, that cost 600,000 lives uh, in order to get the 14th Amendment that said that basically anybody born on the territory of the United States is a, you know, is a, is a U.S. citizen. But I do think that as a result of that political struggle, uh, you know, that, and, and it took another 100 years, unfortunately, for that to actually get realized uh, after the civil rights movement in the 1960s. But I think, you know, the generic answer to all of these questions is one that you, I think, talked about in the book, which is it's a matter of politics, right? Uh, that you have to have people with a certain shared vision uh, and they have to get political power. I mean, that's. You know, that's the way the world works. Uh, and therefore, they've got to come up with the message uh, that is appealing. They've got to build the coalitions. They've got to figure out how to deal with the people standing in their way. And I don't think there's much of a shortcut around, you know, uh, around, that, uh, around that answer. But the ideas have to be right. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, it, it cannot be an exclusive ethnically based or religiously based identity anymore because de facto our country is, you know, is just not ready for that. And by the way, I think that applies to every country in Europe as well. And as you were saying, you know, Netherlands, Germany, Denmark, I mean, not all of them have this understanding of citizenship and what it means to be a Dane or a German uh, that I think Americans finally mm. got to. So uh, let me move to some of the audience questions. There's an interesting one actually uh, about what would you say uh, um, to uh, a Chinese person, uh, you know, President Xi has just been made president for life and uh, she answered that she thought this was good for the people because he's a good leader and 
he's doing the right things. But we can broaden this question, uh, which is one you can ask of all populists. So the populist does something that's actually good, like uh, you know benefits for, for, for families or the economy grows, mm -hmm. which in this country it's actually doing right now. And people say, well, why worry about you know, the FBI or the courts or all of these institutions because doesn't the end essentially justify the means? And isn't you know, our particular leader uh, doing the right thing and therefore why, you know, why worry about all these theoretical concerns about institutions and checks and balances and so forth? Um, well, I think the two questions are very related and, and you've answered the first half of that question very well in a recent article you wrote, if I may remind you. Um, <laughs> which is that there's a huge difference between an institutionalized dictatorship and a personal, personal dictatorship. Mm -hmm. That an institutionalized dictatorship placed by certain rules can constrain the whims of the central leader um, and has much better results, not than democracy, but than personal dictatorship, according to a lot of comparative political science research. It starts fewer disastrous wars, it has better economic outcomes, it's better at granting property rights so that business people can actually make investments without fearing that you know, any squabble with some cousin of the president is going to um, cost them their investments and so on and so forth. So um, the transition from, and I think this is what, what you argued and I agree with you, the transition from institutionalized to more personalized, uh, personalistic dictatorship that we're seeing in China at the moment is very concerning about, about the ability of the system to deliver in the way that it has for the past 30 years um, in the coming decades. Now, I would answer much the same thing about the dangers of populist strongmen within democracies. Um, a lot of populists are reasonably good at managing the economy early on, and part a lot of them have gotten lucky. Um, you know, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela got lucky in part because the oil price really skyrocketed when he got into office. Um, but under those circumstances, he was reasonably good at delivering improvements of social services pe for people and so on and so forth. Well, in the long run, when he no longer had any kind of constraints and nobody was saying, hey, is this actually prudent and aren't you driving up debt too much? Um, that created the conditions for hyperinflation and an economic collapse of a developed democracies, where a, de a developed economy uh, that, that, that lacks for um, many parallels in the world. And I would fear that the same thing might happen in other countries. Putin was relatively good at stabilizing the economy in the early 2000s, again, in part because of skyrocketing gas prices. But he has been very bad at actually modernizing the economy, getting it out of its dependence on fossil fuels and so on. And so the country is now uh, you know, stuck in a middle-income trap. Um, and I would think that if uh, Donald Trump actually succeeded in capturing regulatory agencies, punishing, for example, Amazon in one way or another through the regulatory state because he dislikes Jeff Bezos um, as the owner of the Washington Post, um, I think that would, you know, for the next couple of years, as the world economy is booming, you might not see the effects of that. But in the long run, that is going to seriously depress the dynamism of the American economy. Mm. My personal opinion is that the Democrats are um, a bit underestimating the likelihood that Donald Trump will actually get reelected in 2020 uh, because you know people really vote their pocketbooks and right now the American economy is going gangbusters. And although I think that it's likely to be in for a fall or a crisis or you know something's going to interrupt this, uh, this streak of uh, economic good news, it may not happen you know for another um, four years. And if that's the case, then I think, an eight-year presidency of this sort is going to do a lot more long-term institutional damage than one that's only uh, a four-year presidency. So I have two thoughts on that. I mean, the first is that, um, you know, in most countries, when the populists were in power first um, and first up for re-election, the opposition retained some real chance of ousting them. Once they had been re-elected once, and certainly twice, it became virtually impossible to get rid of them. So that is a very worrying fact. And the other, just on the economic situation, uh, there's this lovely study of Woodrow Wilson's bid for re-election. Um, and they looked at a set of towns across the New Jersey shore. And some of them had recently suffered shark attacks, which led lots of tourists to stay away. 
and others had been spared by the sharks. Now, uh, we can assume safely, I think, that Woodrow Wilson wasn't deciding which town would be attacked by sharks and which wouldn't. <laughs> but as it turns out, the towns which had suffered shark attacks voted for him at much lower rates than the towns that didn't. So people vote for pocketbook and they're quite bad at actually ascribing responsibility for whether the pocketbook is looking good or bad to the actions of actual politicians. And as you're saying, that's very worrying about 2020. Yeah. Donald Trump is apparently terrified of sharks. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so there's a couple of related questions about your earlier work uh, about why younger people seem to be turning against democracy. Uh, I guess we're talking about the millennial generation. So you had said that the support had dropped. Uh, one question wants to know whether there are other ways of characterizing this, whether it's located in certain geographical regions like the coast versus mm. uh, flyover country uh, and that sort of thing. So can you be more granular about you know, who is it among that generation that seems to be losing faith in democracy? So it's definitely, uh, it, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's stronger among less educated people for there's some countervailing evidence there as well. So the figure about military rule, for example, is, is, is especially high among young affluent people, which is a strange fact you wouldn't expect. Um, I haven't looked at it by geography, actually. So mm -hmm. that's something that I'll go away and do tonight. <laughs> <laughs> actually, one of my colleagues at Stanford, Jonathan Rodden, uh, has a very nice study that shows that he doesn't do this by age group, but the one thing that actually correlates best with the Trump vote is actually population density. Mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, even in a red state, you know, the state capital and the place where the, the state university is voted for Hillary and everyone else, you know, outside of it voted, uh, voted for Trump. Uh, so I think there are uh, these very powerful geographic correlates, which correspond, yep. I think, to your identity issues, you know, that people that don't live in big cosmopolitan pluralistic cities, you know, uh, have more traditional values, they're more religious, they're more, you know, have different attitudes towards family life and so on and so forth. And, and, and it's one of the reasons why sort of some of the arguments in the press for the past year and a half saying it's nothing to do with the economy are overly facile <laughs> because they tend to say, well, it's just not true that the poorer you are, the more you voted for Donald Trump. That's right. But um, what is true is that, um, people in parts of a country that are less affluent, that have a lower share of the GDP, that have had less recent investment, that have a higher share of jobs that might be lost to automation, all did vote for Donald Trump. And you see exactly the same pattern in countries around the world. It is less affluent, more rural areas uh, who vote for him. It is people who might still be doing fine, but have good reason to think, you know what, in 20, 40 years, I probably won't be doing so well. Mm -hmm. Okay, now there's a couple of questions that have to do with the structure of our democratic uh, institutions. One uh, question points out that in two recent elections, the popularly elected president was actually not um, chosen because of the electoral college. Another one wants to know what to do about the electoral college, but are there you know, these um, structural defects in a way with American institutions that are contributing to the kind of problem we have where things like gun control that, you know, in, in polls at least get over, you know, background checks get overwhelming support and yet you can't get a bill like that through Congress. Well, well I think part of what you see here is, as you point out in, in your work, is the process of political decay in which institutions become less able to both deliver on some of the sort of pocketbook issues and so on, but also to deal with just some of the, to be responsive to people's preferences and desires. Um, and one of the reasons for that may be that we have too many veto powers in the United States. Um, that some amount of veto power is necessary, right? That's precisely the point about liberal democracy, where you have to have a separation of powers, where you can't have one person making all the decisions. But in the United States, we actually have a tremendous number of veto powers, and that may make it too difficult to, for example, change the electoral system to get rid of a pretty obsolete uh, electoral college. Now, there's some interesting avenues to try and change that. There's legislation that can be introduced at the level of states saying that conditional on, sufficient, on a sufficient number of other states doing the same thing, uh, states are going to start to uh, portion their electoral votes on a proportional basis. Um, so you're not just squandering your weight if the others don't follow suit. That's quite a smart maneuver. Um, so there's ways of doing that, but, but it's hard. 
there's a question uh, referring to Venezuela saying that what's went on in Venezuela 20 years ago looks a little bit like what's going on now. Uh, and you know, what are the, what are the similarities and um, you know, does that experience, I mean, it seems to me in, in certain ways, populism is on its way out in Latin America, having experienced you know, uh, this disaster in, in Venezuela. Is that a possible scenario for us? Or do we have to go through something as bad as Venezuela before the, the lesson sinks in? Well, one of the striking things from my research, and, and I don't want to make too much of that, um, is that we are now at roughly the levels of disapproval of democracy and roughly the levels of openness to authoritarian alternatives as Venezuela was in the 90s, right? So the, so, so the amount of dis disenchantment of our political system that made something like Venezuela possible is now at a roughly equal level. Now, there's lots of disanalogies between Venezuela then and the United States now. Um, we are much more affluent country, and we have actually had more economic growth than Venezuela had for many mm -hmm. decades. Um, so, so we shouldn't make too much of that, but it's a striking fact. Um, you know, I think it's really difficult to know when populists have really left a political system. Certainly, uh, as your colleague Larry Diamond points out, there's been a democratic recession for the past now 11 years, which means that for the past 11 years, according to the best metrics of, we have of this, more countries have experienced democratic slides than democratic gains. Um, and that's really concerning. One of the areas, one of the countries that has been much better is, is, is Latin America, and uh, there's some good examples of that. Argentina seems to be coming out of a democratic crisis potentially right now, mm -hmm. um, and so on and so forth. Um, but we also have some really worrying examples of populists coming back when you thought we were rid of them. Uh, Fujimori, uh, who, you know, whose right-hand man had been filmed bribing all manner of people in the country, um, and who had been put to prison for a long prison sentence for bribery and corruption, has just been pardoned and is now a very politically influential person again. In Italy, Silvio Berlusconi, after two decades of dominating the political scene, had finally been flushed out of the system seemingly in 2011. Um, this lovely orchestra and choir, amateur orchestra and choir, spontaneously assembled in front of the presidential palace where he was tending his resignation and gave a beautiful rendition of Handel's Hallelujah. Um, <laughs> and seven years later, he's back as the kingmaker, and more worryingly, these other populist forces have copied some of his playbook and are now even more powerful, even more influential than him, and some of them are actually more nasty, like the, the League Party that is much more virulent, virulently xenophobic uh, than he ever was. So, so one thing I think about Venezuela is that it does show that there can be forms of far-left populism as well, mm -hmm. and that those two can be corrosive of a political system, and that's something that we should heed. So there's a couple of questions related to both uh, memory and um, education. One asks, uh, you know, the generation that lived through the Second World War and saw the original form of fascist populism, uh, they're pretty much gone now. Uh, I would extend that to other examples, uh, people growing up in Eastern Europe. Yep. Uh, most of the young people had no living experience of communism, so they don't remember that. And I would say even in China, uh, young people uh, were born after the Cultural Revolution, and that so much shaped the and moderated the attitudes of their, their parents that actually were sent out to the countryside but um, mm -hmm. they didn't experience it, so they can have nostalgia for Maoism and, and so forth. So it does seem to me there's a memory problem, but as another questioner says, isn't there something wrong with the education system? I mean, how do you, you, know, how do you keep those memories alive such that you don't have to relearn the same lesson with every generation? So I think, I, you know, look, it, it's a little hard to have a, a very thorough empirical answer to this, because we would have to go back and ask people a bunch of questions about why they had more positive views of democracy 25 years ago, but we just didn't think to ask at the time. Um, but I do think that the most plausible explanation of why more young people are open to this kind of thing is that they um, don't have an understanding of how bad the alternatives would be. That they say, I see exactly what's wrong with our system right now, this, 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 and this. And I don't really have an imagination of how bad alternatives might be. I haven't experienced fascism or communism or, or Maoism, for that matter. So let's try something new. How bad could things get? <laughs> and it's important here to know 
that most democratic breakdowns don't occur. I mean, when we think democratic breakdown, what do you think of? You think of a thing that you never want to mention on stage or in an internet discussion, and that's Hitler Germany, right? So you think of people in, 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 in military boots and, um, you know, with, with, with um, uh, what do you call these fire... Uh, Oh, the wiki. Fire torches yeah. and so on, right? And, and doing the Hitler salute. That is not how most democratic breakdowns happen. They happen by people who say, I'm going to be more democratic than the other people. I'm going to get rid of all of the corruption. Just trust me. Just give me a little bit of power and I'm going to deliver for you, right? And so, uh, so that is something that I think young people might be more attuned to because they can't smell out the dangers. They can't see how bad these things might, might get. And absolutely, one of the answers to that is the educational system. It is to fight for our basic democratic values. And I think it's also, by the way, for, for example, the great work that's being done on Holocaust education to not be redirected, but for, for there to be added modules to that kind of work, but actually saying, what does dictatorship look like today? And what kind of effects does that have? Uh, and so how is it that it's not just better to live in the United States today than in the Third Reich, which is a rel relatively obvious point to make, but why is it better to live in the United States today than in some of us other authoritarian countries now? But, but I want to uh, turn the question back to you here as well. I mean, you know, it, I, I feel like the idea of the end of history is one that, you know, people sort of often know as a slogan or as a meme, um, a, and they don't actually look at the argument in enough detail, right? So you never argued that there was never going to be wars again, there's never going to be revolutions again, but every country would be a democracy tomorrow. But the central point was, if you allow me to, 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 to butcher it in summary, <laughs> um, that the two basic things that the system gives you, which is individual self-determination and collective self-rule, had won the ideological debate, that there wasn't any real competitor to that anymore, and that this is why we could expect it to be reasonably stable in, in the West, in the countries that were already democratic, mm -hmm. as well as obviously in countries like Japan and so on, um, and why it would hopefully continue to grow uh, around the world. I mean, do you think that this stuff we've been talking about today mm -hmm. is, is a blip in that story, that that basic ideological appeal of liberal democracy remains and it's going to continue to have power and perhaps one day China will democratize, perhaps one day um, Russia will democratize and suddenly the story looks very different? Mm -hmm. um, or, or have you grown more skeptical of that core optimism? Well, I think in the long run, there's a lot of reasons that you want a system with checks and balances precisely to deal with you know, the excesses of power when you uh, concentrate it too much. And I think that these populist regimes are in the long run not going to produce real prosperity for their societies because they tend to be crony capitalist and closed and, and so forth. The trouble is that they can persist that way for, you know, for a good long time. And uh, it's not clear that um, existing democracies in that same period of time are going to look better. I mean, there's been this huge shift in global perceptions. China mm. is still growing at six and a half percent, you know, despite being an authoritarian country. Doesn't seem to be moving. Uh, in fact, it's moving in the wrong direction, uh, away from democracy. And on the other hand, people looking at Europe and the United States see big financial crisis in the U.S., the Euro crisis in Europe refugees, polarization, you know, all of these other things. So I do think that um, there is, a, you know, people focus on what's around them and, and, and have a short term, and by that I mean what happened in the last 10 years, you know, focus, which is natural. So I think it's not surprising that uh, you have this. But I guess to really get to the deeper issue uh, that that question raises, this is really what my new book is about, that... Uh, you know, I think that politics is driven by a demand for dignity, the demand uh, that you recognize my dignity. Liberal democracies do this on a universal basis. They say we are all citizens with agency, and the way we recognize that is by giving you rights. You have a right to speech, to association, to worship as you choose, and to vote, most critically to vote, so you have a share of power. So we treat you like an adult, unlike an authoritarian country. But I think the problem with that is that it's not enough. Uh, it's not enough for people to say, well, I'm a generic hmm. citizen or human being, and I've got rights equal to every other citizen in you know, my democracy. They want to be recognized you know, as African-American, as female, as LGBT, as 
<laughs> these days, unfortunately, as a white person, you know, uh, there's, there's many other stories and experiences of collective suffering and marginalization that, that make people want to have, you know, these other kinds of identities. And I think that's the basis of nationalism, both nationalism and I think politicized religion like, you know, Islam. All of these, you know, Putin and the Islamic State both have this, this um, narrative of victimization, you know, uh, that the outside world has, you know, oppressed us and held us down and doesn't grant us the kind of respect that we uh, really deserve. And I think that that, unfortunately, is what's driving a lot of the, you know, the kind of politics that you are uh, describing. Uh, so it means that, you know, buried within the nice peace and prosperity of a democracy are people's demands for something more. Uh, and I think that's really the challenge, you know, that we are, we are facing right now. So does that mean I took back my earlier position? Uh, you be the judge. Uh, I actually, I, I will point out that I said all of this stuff in the original end of history. At the <laughs> end of the end of history, the, on end the last the page. Yes, yeah, so and nobody, nobody ever got to that final chapter. <laughs> so. Uh, so um, I believe that, yeah, so perhaps I, I just want to say oh, okay. one thing at the end, if I may. So I'm, I'm still chewing on, 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 on whether or not that's a revision of your position or not. I mean, I think um, that's a real question, right? I mean, what can, what's a project of building an equal multi-ethnic society where we all feel recognized? And what are the limits of that? How recognized can people ever feel? And how recognized do they need to feel? Mm -hmm. And is that a sort of race to the bottom? where the, the demand for recognition becomes ever more granular in a way that the system just cannot deliver? Or do we manage that? And I think that's one of the big questions of the next, of the next decades. I mean, wh what I do want to say is, because I'm sometimes accused of being very depressing at these talks. <laughs> <laughs> and and I don't, I'm not depressed by any of this. I mean, one way of thinking about this is that when I came of age politically, I thought that there's important political issues and decisions, and I, I, I always cared about politics, but that ultimately the stakes are limited. Now I think the stakes are really high, which is scary, but it's also empowering, because it means that what we do actually really, really matters. Um, and I think if you, know, if you agree with some of our analysis today, then you'll walk away from here with an idea of what you might want to do. And if you disagree with our analysis, you probably have your own ideas about what's more important to you and what you should do. Um, the best image for that that I've heard comes from Amos Oz, who says there's a big fire raging in the world. And it can be really daunting to know what to do. We have, you know, have a little bit of Diet Coke here. Um, let's pretend it's water. Um, you know, when I can go and, and, and pour a little bit of water on the fire, that's not going to do anything. I mean, this is, you know, not very much water and the fire is huge. But thankfully, there's a bunch of you, thank you very much, who came out tonight. And so there's a big room full of people. And if each of us actually takes a little bit of water and pours it in the fire, then collectively, we might just be able to put it out. Um, so I can't promise you a happy end. But unlike people in, in Russia and China and Iran, we retain our political agency. We can still go and fight for our values. So I think we should. On that note, <laughs> so ends another event of the Commonwealth Club in its 116th year of enlightened discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks.